Hi, I'm John Ward, creator of Scratcho and A Causal, which is currently on Kickstarter. You can find me uh, on my website at arbutusfilms.com, on Twitter at the same, or just search me for me on uh, Kickstarter. And you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries, of course. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator, a Canadian out of Vancouver. Of course, he is from across the pond. He is the creator of A Causal, which has a Kickstarter currently ongoing, which is amazingly overfunded. We're joined by the ever-talented John Ward. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Kurt. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, yeah, my name's John. Uh, as you said, I'm in Vancouver, BC. Uh, I'm a writer, uh, creator, filmmaker, podcaster, do a little bit of everything. That's pretty much in a nutshell. Uh, ex-musician, ex-physicist. Uh, We're going to talk about uh, A Causal today, which is uh, our Canadian uh, crime thriller, which is current on Kickstarter. This is the, the final issue so you can grab all three of the issues it's drawn by ev cantata and lettered by Luc lucas catoni it's a sci-fi sort of tinged um, crime story about a misfit team of cops and criminals who have a device that gets messages from the future so it's kind of like a story about science religion belief faith and betrayal so what is the most misunderstood aspect about the sci-fi detective genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand i mean i think it's got to still be about about people the sci-fi element often takes over uh the storytelling and then we lose touch with the humanity of the stories i think stories have always got to be about people wanting something and a search for truth or a search for identity and so i think that's the thing that kind of usually gets lost people start out with kind of like a hook which is a sci-fi hook but sometimes that just goes too far and can, we kind of lose touch with what what the characters are i read your website read your your bio ex physicist <laughs> <laughs> Tur turned comic writer bit of a bit of a leap when it comes to career changes how did that come about and why did you need that change well, I, well the change was kind of forced on me because i was a postdoc here in BC, bc at the university of victoria and you know my grant basically ran out and i applied for new jobs elsewhere and didn't get anything so the, the career change was sort of not my decision in some sense but the reason i got into writing in the first place was because of star trek if we skip back like you know to high school i was i basically failed physics and math in high school i was a terrible student and it was through star trek that like i kind of learned that i wanted to be a writer but while i was kind of pursuing that that path like i kind of started teaching myself like little bits of you know the technical stuff you know you want to write a script that kind of has all the right techno babble right yeah. so i started teaching myself like basic physics and kind of i just really started to love it it kind of led to me wanting to kind of pursue that. So I applied to a bunch of universities in the UK um, and got rejected from all but one of them. And I went there and basically I just went into physics. I still was still writing on the side, but kind of my career trajectory had changed to become more about science. But then when I was fortunate enough to come to, to BC uh, and then had to kind of make a decision about what I wanted to do, it was kind of like that seemed like a good opportunity to kind of jump back more into like the creative aspect because that's really sort of the thing that got me going in the first place. You're also a, a podcast co-host as well being a podcaster myself here looking at of course 49 degrees north podcast i think i'm on the 42nd parallel myself how did that come about and what's the status of it yeah that came about because there's a lot of great podcasts about writing and writers and the creative process and they're they're all based in the states which is fine but there wasn't really anything up up here and I was living in Toronto at the time and I came back to Vancouver and I was meeting with people and just sort of pitching them like, oh, we should, you know, we should kind of meet like all of these writers who are in town and, and chat with them over pizza and all these, this stuff. And everyone was like, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, but no, nothing happened. And so I kind of realized at one point that I was going to be the person who had to kind of go and speak to these people. I, I didn't want to do it. Like I'm terrified of speaking. You know, I hate the sound of my own voice, especially when you're editing a podcast and you just have hours of it. That's kind of how it came about. I just kind of wanted to speak to other creatives about how they approached writing or producing. You know, what are the lessons that they learned uh, through each of the projects that they've done? And so I started the show. It was a little bit rocky, I think, to start with. But over time, kind of sort of figured out how to speak to creators and kind of really sort of dig into like their process elements. And, and you know, I basically only spoke to like Canadians who were on the West Coast uh, or in Alberta. 
and I think we've done like 35 episodes to date. So we're on hiatus right now. Uh, so that's how I describe it. I mean, I think there's more episodes to come, but I'm just kind of quite busy at the moment with other things. And so I, we'll get back to it. Being a podcaster is difficult. Being on this side of the, the microphone is difficult as well. So I, I feel your pain there. I understand from a from an in, one introvert to another. I, I do understand that that side of things. It can be rather difficult as well too. But but once you find a passion, especially since you're in the same industry in the same field of, of comic writing and writing in general, you know, you have that camaraderie that I don't think a lot of people who are aren't in this type of industry, they don't know the the trials and tribulations and the successes. Yeah, and I think that's the thing about, you know, the, the famous phrase, you know, you have to see it to be it. Mm. And, you know, for me growing up, I didn't know any writers, I didn't know any real creatives. You know, my dad was a musician, so I knew that was a path that existed. But I think a lot of people don't, I, mean, I think things are changing, but I think a lot of people don't know what the, the process is to kind of actually make something and how do you make those connections. And I think having conversations with people about their journeys, I think can be quite helpful to kind of pass on, share for other people. And hopefully that will inspire them to not be afraid of, of kind of going down that route. Back to Causal here. The Kickstarter video itself is well done. I love the concept of it. I love the fact that you have an amazing team around you. What was the first piece of artwork you got back from your amazing artist that was way better than what you had written on the page? Well, I think probably page one. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, like working with VV was was great. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, he, to start with, we kind of did eight pages and they all kind of came in sequentially. But I think right from page one, I think that, that first page kind of really got me thinking straight away about what I'd written and how he had taken it and kind of elevated it in a different direction. And then I was then sort of on my heels going, oh, okay, well, how do I change, you know, what I'd done kind of on the on the storytelling side or you know, on the written side about like the lettering and kind of pacing and how do I how do I reflect what he's done and try and get, you know, gives Lucas something to kind of uh, you know dig into. So I did, I'd say it was probably from page one, but that's because I'm a writer and I kind of really love seeing the art come in just from from the artists. I think they they you know they always bring something great to the table. So looking at this as your your final issue in the series, what have you learned from creating your very first A causal to this final issue here? What was that progress like from a creative writing perspective? It was slow. I think um I think what I've learned is kind of to try and you know get everything um done in a more expedient fashion sort of on the project management side of it so with the last issue in particular you know i wrote it uh such a long time ago that for different reasons um it just didn't you know we didn't get into production until uh you know quite late in the day and then and my thinking had changed so much on that point so then it was kind of you know a real sort of conversation with ev and and you know with lucas uh around like what what kind of story we we're going to tell so i think just getting Getting things sorted out up front a little better would, was a big lesson I, I learned from this project. It just took too long between issue one and issue three to, to really come out. And I think from a reader's perspective, it's kind of frustrating when you have to wait such a long time because you don't know if the book's actually ever going to come. From the creative side, you still have it hanging over you. And sometimes you just kind of want to finish a project so you can kind of put it to bed and then get on to something else. So I, lots of lessons, I think, for, for me as a creator and, um, you know, lots of things I wish I could have done differently. Kickstarters are like a second job, and I'm sure this isn't your, your first rodeo. What have you done differently in this final campaign for this series that compared to other campaigns? Yeah, I think this time around, I've kind of got variant covers, which is something I haven't done before. And they've been, you know, they've been snapped up. And this time we're also doing a uh, competition, which is running right now. So... Um, it's basically a Canadian B movie film title competition. So if you want to jump in on that, please uh, just back the book and then you can kind of uh, be entered into that. So having that kind of competition to kind of help build a community to, in and around the actual campaign, I think is what I'm trying to do differently this time around. I think the first few times it was basically creating the information and then pushing it at people. But, you know, that works to an extent, but I think trying to build a community is really the, the main lesson around this, I think, that I'm, I'm taking from it. So how do you do that? How do you kind of bring value to everybody in, in the conversation? Uh, the reader is just as much a part of this, you know, as the creators in some sense. And trying to figure out how to you know, make their, their contribution worthwhile for them is, is the challenge. 
I think there's 19 days left. It ends uh, mid July. This is just a couple of breaks. Obviously, we've got Canada Day and then uh, the U.S. Uh, holidays in between. So, uh, but yeah, it's uh, about about two and a half weeks. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? I think this, the second is probably you have to be tenacious. Just because you want something, it doesn't mean that you're going to get it. Um, sometimes you have to be prepared to take a longer route and a longer journey. And so you have to keep at it. Overnight successes are, you know, lauded, but often, often a myth. Uh, and I think that's that's probably the piece of advice that kind of it wasn't the first piece of advice, but I think it's one of the, the the more important things I kind of took from from other people. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I think for music, which is kind of weird because usually it's usually it's the, the music that has the power. But I think I think listening to different kinds of music when I was really little and like hearing the lyrics and kind of understanding that they were telling a story and then you know as I got older going to see bands play and seeing the power that that the lyrics were able to evoke in 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 people and how some songs that were you know similar kind of you know high tempo or energetic music didn't resonate with people because the lyrics were not very good so I think that's kind of the for me like that's where language sort of had its sort of moment for me where it crystallized like seeing it seeing it through music um which is kind of interesting like because i thought i thought it might be through books but i think you understand that language has power in a book because it changes how you think and changes how you feel but i think seeing it on mass through other people um through music was kind of like really sort of uh, informative for me what song or what music sets you on a creative path <laughs> I mean, my tastes are pretty eclectic at the moment, but I think right now I'm listening to a lot of, um, you know, fresh core and grind. So like super fast, super noisy. Sounds like, you know, like a blender in a dishwasher, kind of like just like <laughs> that kind of music. It just at the moment, that's the thing that's really driving me. Um, I, I couldn't tell you why. It's just a phase that, that I'm going through right now, but it's the noisier and faster, uh, the better. So you've just hit hundred words a minute type deal while you're uh, <laughs> you're rammering through your chapters. I actually think paradoxically, I'm actually slower typing listening to the music at that speed. You'd think I would just be actually quicker, but I think yeah, for me it's probably the other way around. There's an inverse relationship. The slower the music, the faster I type. Faster the music, the slower I type. <laughs> <laughs> First, I've heard of that. That's that's new for me. <laughs> who's your favorite character that you wrote for in the A Cause, and who's the character you? hated writing for in the series mm. i think i think the character i liked writing the most was was anders because he uh, ironically he doesn't really say very much until the final issue um but trying to kind of give him a character arc without using dialogue uh, and just kind of giving EV something to play with on the art side, I think was my favorite part. Um, so it's kind of a, a bit of an unusual answer, I think, for that one. Um, so yeah, I think he was my favorite character to write for because it was just just a very challenging problem to have. I, I don't know if I hated writing anybody in particular. I you know, there's a there's a couple of characters who I think I would redo, like in some ways, to kind of like tighten. But I think that's true of, of every creator. I mean, you know, things are kind of abandoned, you know, in some way, like not necessarily completed. And I think I would still want to go and do a bit more of a polish. But um, but yeah, I don't think I hate I hated writing for them. I'm just curious. Some some people really liked certain characters when they wrote them. Other people really didn't like writing certain certain characters, but the fans loved them. Type deal. Like I've seen I've seen like that things like that. Oh, yeah, absolutely! I can totally, I totally don't believe that. I think for this book, because it's kind of, it's pretty tightly constrained between just the three main characters. I mean, it's, you know, there is external, there's external plot happening, and and there are other characters, but we don't really get to see a lot of them. Everything's really sort of in this kind of perspective of one of the, the one. He's actually one of the two main characters, and uh, and then Anders is kind of like the the supporting character in some some sense up until the third issue, but. When it's so tightly constrained that way, I kind of feel that like you as the creative team are putting a lot of yourselves into it. So 
you know, I mean, yes, I mean, I don't, there are things about myself that I don't like, um, but I don't know if those were the things that like I was reflecting. I think it was like other, other elements. So I didn't, I didn't dislike those parts of it. So subconsciously, you just didn't throw anything in there that you realize as of this moment. I mean, I think I, I think I probably did, but like I, as I said, the reality, the reality of that still hasn't hit me yet. So, um, so we'll see. Ask me again in the in a couple of a couple of months' time. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I think for me it was uh, the uh, Star Trek writer Ron Ronald D. Moore. Uh, he was he was a uh, a person who was interested in writing, wanted to write, and took an opportunity to, as the story goes, basically to drop his script on the desk while he was uh, at at Paramount uh, on a tour. Uh, and I liked that kind of story. I mean, I don't know how true it is, but I, I liked the fact that you know somebody from who wasn't connected to the industry was able to kind of do that and kind of use his storytelling to impress enough people to kind of get give him an opportunity to write and he's a a fantastic writer and you know went went from star trek to a bunch of other amazing shows so i think uh, he's a a, an inspiration for me from a professional standpoint you've had multiple kickstarter campaigns that have been successful you have had a podcast that's currently on hiatus that's a success and i'm sure you've done much more that we haven't had a chance to talk about, at least this time around, which means you just have to come back on and talk about all of your other projects that you've done so that, you know, we can dive into what makes John a creative and talented person more so than we did today. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I think I think we're using success in a very, very broad definition of the term here. Um, I think like one could argue that like uh, there's a certainly a case to be made that I'm not professionally successful, but I think I think personally like I'm I mean I'm in a, a good place um, at the moment. I think it's it's tough. I think uh, for for a lot of people, personally being able to balance you know all the requirements and needs of uh, trying to be creative in a in a in a world that kind of doesn't really value creativity and trying to find a balance is, is difficult. And I think we all, a lot of us struggle with, you know, maintaining good mental health. Um, and at the moment, I kind of feel like I've been able to work through that and, you know, with my family um, and I'm in, personally in a pretty good place right now, yeah. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Uh, <laughs> um, not very well sometimes, I guess. Um, I. I I think failure is kind of part of the process. I think for a while, like I was really terrified of failing. And I think as a society, we don't value failure in the same way. We kind of always want to talk about success, but I think failure is the thing that happens most often. So getting to, you know, getting to grips with that as quickly as you can, I think is helpful for any creator. Uh, A couple of years ago, I basically set out, I set myself a mission to get, um, you know, a hundred sort of rejections uh, for different projects, and I was tracking them uh, in, in a in a database, and I was racked them up pretty fast. So, so that was, uh, I guess, that was good mission accomplished. But I think, you know, I I think it was just important to kind of do because I kind of got over my fear of of you know quote unquote failing uh, by doing that. Um, you get we get rejected for things all the time. Things don't work out the way that we want them to do. Want want them to go. Um, and that, and that's okay. I think there's lessons in in the failures, and so I, I kind of, you know, I don't want failure. I mean, I don't want to keep failing like all the time, but I, I think I'm not afraid of it anymore. And I think that's been a big shift in in how I've approached um, storytelling. The younger generation is looking at your work, and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or a creative person in some way, shape, or form. And now the fact that you have the younger generation with you looking up to you as an inspirational person, albeit a bit early, maybe they'll become inspired in some way, shape, or form creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Uh, That's a great question. Um, I I think fundamentally, I think it's about making still making connections. I think you have to inspire people to connect and build a community, whatever that looks like um, in the future and, and what tools are around to support that community. I think uh, we we can 
hypothesize about that all day. But I think fundamentally it's about not doing everything on your own, whether it's, you know, um, whether it's art or, you know, some of the creativities, to, you know, or, or, you know, tackling the climate crisis that's inevitably going to engulf uh, the generation after the next one. I think uh, working together, um, collaboration, um, community, that's going to be the way way forward. So I think trying to figure out how to inspire communities to exist in whatever way, shape or form they can is is really the thing that like I, I think will be the the, the crux of what future generations can do for each other. If your life was a comic or a film, since you like both, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Uh, I don't know the soundtrack at the moment what it would be. <laughs> it would be uh, just like uh, a mishmash of, uh, of grind, thrash, and, uh, and hardcore. Um, I'd like to, like to have more... Um, more music in there than that though but i think that's kind of what i'd be saying right now like i think the title would be i don't know something something uh, i don't know off the top of my head i'd say something like i squared equals minus one or something um because i think for me like learning about math and, and physics has been kind of like an important part of my journey um and touching on like complex numbers are just I, I just find them fascinating and uh, I, I really wish we'd have been taught those at high school because uh, I actually may have paid attention at that point uh, so something that touches on that but kind of like which is kind of like just also kind of just very short and has numbers in it I like uh, I like titles with numbers for some reason um, so that, that was probably would be the title soundtrack yeah I yeah mostly mostly grind and fresh core I suspect not not a best-selling soundtrack obviously but <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, uh, but certainly an interesting one yeah. Definitely, for sure. <laughs> well, John, I do hate to say, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, Scott. It's been great. For those that want to support you and, of course, find you and, of course, support the campaign as well, too, where are you on online and in social media? Uh, you can go to my website, which is arbutusfilms.com. Uh, or on Twitter, I'm at uh, Arbutus underscore films, uh, same on Instagram. And I'm trying to get on Blue Sky and a bunch of others and to be to be determined what the handle will be for those. But yeah, if you go to uh, just search for A Causal on Twitter, for example, and uh, you'll, you'll probably find me and a, a lot of other people talking about uh, some kind of weird metaphysics that I don't know exactly what, what's going on. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You could, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not a number whatsoever. That goes to a different website. You can, of course, find, because the website is going through an update, come to our YouTube channel. It is a lot more updated than our website because it's youtube.com forward slash Media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. You can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just for or just search for Two Geeks Talking on your favorite podcast streaming service like Spotify, iTunes, and everything like that. And of course, as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.